What's wrong with you people? I'm serious. I'm not asking, uh, you know, how do I feel about this or how can I intellectually rationalize this or what do the studies show? You know, ultimately we're asking the question of what does the Bible say? It's a specific attack against the true God because when's the last time you heard someone stub their toe and go, oh, Buddha? <laughs> it, it doesn't happen. Jesus wants the rose! That's the point of the God! All right, we are live. What is up? Reasons for Jesus. Worldview Warriors coming at you as always. Dave Wilson here with Skippy John Jansen, and uh, we got another we got another show for you tonight. I'm excited about this one. Yeah, it's going to be really good, and it's going to kind of set us up uh, for uh, going a little bit deeper into a subject that's uh, a, a difficult one for a lot of people. Um, but today we're going to be uh, going over a little bit of end times and uh, a term that gets thrown around in several Facebook groups. If you actually search in Reasons for Jesus, you'll see tons of arguments that Dave Wilson and Tyler Hood have had through <laughs> over time. And uh, that's uh, eschatology. So Dave, um, what is eschatology? Why is it important? Um, and, and why uh, are a lot of people afraid to kind of uh, get at it? Um, well, I think, I mean, just to get into... What eschatology is, eschatology, you know, there, there's a lot of like 25 cent words that come up here, but eschatology basically just means the study of the last things or the last things of, of human history, uh, maybe more uh, more precisely there. Um, and again, this is just, this is a topic that again can be confusing. There are a lot of different perspectives out there. Um, it's something where, you know, I always kind of preliminarily warn people who will post about end times or something like that, just like, hey, just a heads up, you're about to hear six different answers that all sound really good. Um, so so again, yeah, it's just, it's end times is what we're talking about. And what we're going to do tonight is sort of explore the different camps that are out there, um, sort of what the different views are, why the different views are the way that they are. And, uh, you know, our, our heart behind this is to probably more than anything, just kind of take the fear out, take the confusion out. Because again, you know, most people don't have, you know, a hundred hours to drop into studying, studying something like this. So um, again, that's, that's just kind of what we're doing. We're going to be defining a lot of terms. Um, we're hoping to just encourage you guys to dive into the word. Um, this is uh, definitely a, an exciting subject and, and it's good to do that um, with. Uh, one thing that we do want to encourage is let secondaries stay secondaries. And what we mean by that is there are different perspectives here, um, but that's okay to have that. You know, this is one of those positions that the church has never really had a super tight consensus mm -hmm. on. And we'll get into that a little bit as we look at the different positions. But um, that is just to say that this isn't a primary gospel issue. It's not an issue that we need to see people dividing over. Unfortunately, we do see that sometimes. Um, so again, that's, that's just kind of what we're hoping to fight against, I guess, a little bit in this video. Um, yeah, and I would hope that by the end of this, one of the primary things that people will be able to see is uh, one of the major aspects that when we're looking at end times, what we can agree upon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there is, there's a lot of things that we agree on. And, and one thing that I like, I like reading some of the old like confessions and creeds and things like that. And uh, I, I find it interesting how I think just the writers of those at the time realized that there wasn't necessarily a consensus of how things are going to go down. So it usually says something about, you know, we believe that, uh, you know, Christ is reigning and he will come back for us and judge the living and the dead. And, you know, it's like that's that's kind of the core thing. But I mean, all these different camps, we're going to be talking pre-mill, post-mill, a-mill, like all this stuff. And, and we're going to break it down. But, you know, the things we all agree on, we agree in the inspiration of Scripture, that Scripture is the standard. That's where we get our doctrine mm -hmm. from. Uh, we agree that we're saved uh, by grace alone, um, by grace alone, through faith alone. And um, we believe in the return of Christ, the physical return of Christ, the physical resurrection uh, of the dead. Um, so again, there's a lot, there's a lot of things to agree on there. Without a doubt. So when we are looking at uh, the end times and the study of it, a lot of times people will come into the scripture uh, when they're defining their view upon it, they'll bring their presuppositions. And uh, typically you have historical, grammatical uh, versus the analogy of faith. So what are those things and how does that impact? Yeah, so that's, you know, the, the more I study eschatology, and I, I found myself in sort of different camps in different phases of, of life and study and, and things like that. But um, yeah, the, the presuppositions or the assumptions that we bring to the scriptures are really going to steer how we interpret them and how we understand them. Um, so there's hermeneutics, again, another like 
fancy 25 cent word. Hermeneutics is basically just saying how we interpret scripture, like what method do we use to understand scripture. Um, and one of the primary uh, methods that we use is called the historical grammatical. Um, and it's basically, it's just, it's a, it's a literal interpretation. It is, what does the text say? It's sort of the plain face value. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, so this is, a very good way of, of understanding scripture. I mean, this probably should be the thing that we look at first when we go to the scripture. What is the plain meaning of the text? Um, and then, you know, from there, we we dive deeper, right? We don't just stop there. But then on the flip side, there's also something called the analogy of faith. And that is basically the principle that really kind of came out of the Reformation or, or was really utilized there. But it's the idea of letting scripture interpret scripture, um, letting, you know, the New Testament interpret the Old Testament. Um, and letting the clear passages of Scripture shine light on the more ambiguous passages of Scripture mm -hmm. and vice versa. Uh, so again, this is also something we want to do. So grammatical, historical, analogy of faith, we want to use both of them. But what ends up happening, what we notice when we look at sort of these different camps and different positions, is that people will generally weigh one above the other. And depending on which way you go, you're going to lean one direction mm -hmm. uh, or the other. So <laughs> very true. Um, I, I know that uh, your position and mine has uh, changed over time. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I wasn't even aware of, I, I think when I was a younger kid, I just assumed everyone thought what they read and left behind was what was yeah. going to happen. And you were kind of the same way. But yep. as you know, you study and your presuppositions that you once had and it, the way you look at it come and change. Uh, it definitely changes the way that we view and interpret the scripture. Absolutely. And one of the key texts when we're looking at uh, the end times that all of the different camps um, have very different views on is Revelation 20. Yeah. So what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to read through uh, Revelation 20, uh, pretty much uh, verses 1 through 8 to give kind of the background behind it. And then Dave, if you would just kind of break down why this is important and how it kind of helps um, give understanding to the various camps. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to start at verse one. It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand, the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those whom the authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are the, in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea." Yeah, so uh, there's a lot there. There's definitely there's a lot there. We're we're definitely not going to be uh, unpacking all of that tonight. <laughs> no. Um, but the reason we bring this text up is because this is kind of the key text that sort of forms the different uh, the different camps or the different perspectives. Um, and really, what those camps are named after, it's kind of unfortunate that the camps are named after the millennium because literally this is the only time in scripture, the only chapter of the Bible where a specific millennium is reigned. And there's a lot of other things that happen in, mm -hmm. in eschatology and in, in end times and things like that. But this is sort of where we find ourselves. So the, the really the questions that um, need answered here, at least in regards to what we're talking about tonight, is um, when is Satan bound? So it's talking about this thousand years. So the question is, when is that? And then the second question is, what is the nature of that binding? What does that look like? Um, so there's primarily two camps, and then we're going to break it down further. Um, so the first, the first thing is going to be, uh, again, when is Satan bound? When is this millennial reign? Is this pre or post return of Christ? Mm -hmm. um, so on one side, we have the pre-millennial camp that says that Christ is going to come back and following Christ's return, there is this millennium. 
Uh, and then there's some other stuff that happens down the road. And then the post-millennial camp says the opposite. They say, well, no, uh, the millennium happens prior to uh, Christ's return. So it's post-millennial, pre- or post-millennial. And then both of those will, will break it down a little bit further. Um, so under like post-millennialism, for example, we have uh, something called amillennialism. And amillennialism basically says that the, the millennium is not something that is a literal, um, a literal thousand years. This is just sort of an extended period of time. So that deals with kind of the substance of the millennium. So again, question one is when is the millennium? Question two is what is the substance of that? Mm-hmm. So from that point, we can just kind of go and um, break down these positions a little bit. So we'll, uh, where should we start? Uh, why don't we start at uh, historic pre-mill? Because that's uh, one that's been around pretty much uh, uh, after Christ. You see it's in some of the early writings, actually, of the early church fathers. So why don't we start with that one? Cool. Um, so historic pre-mill, this is probably the oldest of the positions. This seems to be... Uh, held by many of the early church fathers uh, in the first two centuries or so. And in this view is, again, it's it's kind of easy to understand. It's the general thrust. I'll put it on the screen here because we have a little, we have a chart. We have a chart here. Okay, cool. Um, so th- what they see is, is where we are here. Um, we are in the kingdom remains through the Holy Spirit. So here we have Jesus' birth. We have Jesus' um, earthly ministry. And then we have basically the church age here. Um, And then they see a future apostasy. They see Christ returning. And then followed by that is the millennium where Satan is bound. There is a kingdom of heaven uh, that is physical and on the earth then. And following that is uh, Satan is loose. There's another rebellion. And then there's the final judgment. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, this is probably, I think, the easiest and, and maybe the simplest um, thing to understand. This is probably something that I would assume most of our viewers are familiar with, the idea that Christ is going to reign um, for a thousand years on the earth in the future. Um, so yeah, they see future tribulation and all that. Um, Whereas, so you have a future tribulation uh, and then you have you have pre-trib and post-trib, which really um, is kind of the key thing that separates uh, historic from what's called dispensational uh, premillennialism, correct? Right. So that is that is kind of another view. So there's two forms. That, so again, I said we we first broke it down in terms of pre or post millennial, mm-hmm. where where located, where time wise mm-hmm. is the millennium. Um, and there are going to be two views under the umbrella of premillennialism. That's historic, like we mentioned, that is again fairly straightforward. And then there is a view called dispensational premillennialism. Um, dispensational pre- premillennialism as such is probably the newest of the, of the positions, but it, and it's also probably the most common one. Mm-hmm. Um, this is, if you're familiar with like left behind, um, this is the, the idea that's, that's portrayed there. There's going to be a future rapture where mm-hmm. the, uh, believers in Christ who are alive, you know, disappear. It's a secret rapture. Um, and then, uh, some other, some other kind of cool stuff there happens. Um, but there, there's a rapture, there's an antichrist, then there's a millennium. So it obviously has in common with historic premillennialism, the timing of the millennium, but it's a lot more complicated and there's a lot more distinctions that they add in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so one, uh, interesting thing that I was watching, I was listening to, uh, John MacArthur, who's, I mean, a fantastic pastor. He is a, uh, dispensational premillennialist and, and he said that, uh, the dispensationalism, the, the essence of it is recognizing a sharp distinction between Israel and the church. Mm. So he said that's that's kind of the big thing because it's through that that you get the idea of the church being raptured or taken out because eschatologically the church and Israel are sort of two different groups with two different futures in terms of what uh, what what that looks like. Now according to um, MacArthur, uh, he, he thinks that they start out making the right distinctions, but then some of them kind of go beyond that and make some erroneous distinctions. Um, and just one thing to say, too, is that none of these views are monolithic. I mean, you can find various dispensationalists, various amillennials who, who are going to disagree on some things. 
you know, our goal is just to kind of give you the general thrust of it. But um, what I, where I was going with uh, with MacArthur there is he says that, you know, some dispensationalists have made even the distinctions that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are two different things. And he's mm-hmm. like, well, that's I think that's wrong, even though I'm a dispensationalist. And um, some of them would even go so far as to say that there are certain books of the Bible that are for us as Christians and some that are not. So like there's some that would say the Sermon on the Mount is not for us as Christians. That's something for Israel, for Jews. Um this obviously we're going to profoundly disagree with, uh, but again, that's sort of the the fringe end of things. Uh, but dispensationalism, um, if you look at it, is something that really values highly the grammatical historical approach to understanding Scripture. So one of the main things that they're going to look at is they're going to look at all the different promises uh, that God gave to Israel in the Old Testament. Um, a lot of them, especially dealing with land, um, that Israel was going to possess all this land eternally, basically. Um, And they're going to say, you know, basically there's nowhere, no way that this was literally fulfilled as promised anywhere, um, anywhere in redemptive history. Um, So again, dispensationalism is really going to drive home the um, grammatical historical uh, interpretation. It's, you know, God is faithful to his promises. If God said, you you guys are going to have this land, you're going to get that land or else God is not God. You know, he's not, not faithful to his, um, To that. Uh, Another thing that's kind of unique to dispensationalism is they view uh, the kingdom of God as being something that was offered. So Christ came as the king and offered uh, to bring the kingdom, and Israel rejected that kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then because of that, the kingdom isn't not coming, it's just postponed. Um, And that's where probably the the most distinct feature of um, dispensationalism is the idea of this great parenthesis. Um, And what that is, is just that it it kind of looks at redemptive history as, okay, God's working with Israel, doing these things, here's the direction we're going. Uh, And then there's the great parenthesis that's um, the church age. So this is God basically stops dealing with Israel, deals with the church, saves the Gentiles, then pulls the church out via the rapture, and then returns his work uh, through Israel. Um, So let me actually pull up, there is a a chart here. that we have here. Oh, that's a store primo. Okay. So this one, like I said, it's similar to the uh, the last version that we showed you, the historic or classical premillennial position. But this one uh, just has a lot, a lot more going on there. Um, so we see, you know, this. We see the rapture. Then follows that is this tribulation. Then there's Christ's second coming bodily. Then there's the kingdom. This this thousand year, uh, and then there is towards the end of the thousand years, which they're very insistent again, that it's, it's a literal thousand years. Um, and then there is this revolt and then sort of a final judgment. And then we go into, uh, the eternal state. So the, uh, so the dispensational view is that the first, uh, resurrection where they meet in the sky, uh, with Christ comes prior to the tribulation. Whereas the historical pre mill position is that that comes before, correct? Right. Okay. Right. And, uh, you know, and it's in, um, it's in the dispensational position. So I, I remember years ago I was at a church and they announced that they were going to be doing a series on eschatology, and I was super excited. Um, I wasn't really dug in necessarily to any one position. Um, this was, you know, probably eight years ago or so. Um, but I was just excited, hoping that they would really present the different views. And and you know, the pastor got on stage the first you know, week one of the sermon, he's like, well, there's three primary views. And I was like, oh, cool, pre, post, and amillennialism. And he goes up and he says, you know, the three views are pre, post, and (laughs) mid-trib. And what those mean is that's basically dealing, those are all arguments within the dispensationalist camp on when exactly the rapture is. Is it, you know, prior to uh, the tribulation? Is it halfway through or is it at the end? Mm -hmm. So that's where those words pre, trib, and uh, post, um, yeah, that, that's where those come in. So again, like I was just disappointed because, you know, he didn't even say a word about any of the other positions. It was just, you know, which variant of dispensationalism do you want? Um, which, you know, he held that position. That's fine. But <laughs> it was just, it was, it was frustrating when I was hoping to have it be more of a sort of open, here some options for paths to take. But I guess it is what it is. In comparison to, you know, the ah mill view or the post mill, would you say that there's a heavier reliance upon Old Testament prophecy uh, with the pre mill view? 
Yeah, I think so. Um, and again, that's where really the we have this sort of contrast of what are you going to hold up higher, uh, the grammatical, uh, grammatical historical interpretive method, or are you going to rely more on the analogy of faith and letting scripture interpret scripture? Um, so again, dispensationalists are going to say, well, the other prophecies are fulfilled literally. You know, Jesus literally rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Um, you know, he was literally born of a virgin, you know, and all this, sure. this other stuff. So they're uh, very resistant to, you know, sort of spiritualizing or um, anything like that, any of the texts, any of the promises, uh, things like that. Whereas the other camps are a little bit more comfortable saying, oh, well, it seems like the New Testament authors understood this text in a very different way than what we would have expected if we were just using mm -hmm. um, a grammatical, literal um, sort of method. Definitely. <clears throat> um, anything else uh, you want to go into on dispensationalism? Uh, what would you say is the primary, like, big key text uh, that is typically uh, a huge factor for uh, e either the historical uh, pre-mill view or uh, dispensational? I think for the dispensational view, a very primary text is going to be Daniel 9 okay. uh, in, the, in the vision here. Um, and actually, I think we have that if you want to... Yeah, do I have it up here? I don't think I have it up here. I you have, have it, it over there. Yeah, so... Daniel 9, uh, verses 24 through 27. Uh, so 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, a prince sh there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is uh, to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. It, its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to the sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Okay, so that's uh, <laughs> a lot to just jump into, Without you know, that. obviously. But uh, what this is, is this is a vision that Daniel was given uh, hundreds of years before Christ. Mm -hmm. And it was basically saying, okay, here is sort of what... God is going to do in Israel in the future. Um, and Daniel was writing at a time, uh, if you're familiar with sort of your Old Testament history, uh, the kingdom of Israel was set up. They eventually split. Both uh, both kingdoms that it split off into uh, fell into apostasy um, and were conquered and sent into exile. Um, and so Daniel is writing shortly after that exile. Um, and he is looking at, you know, what is the future? Like, where is, where is God in this this sort of chaos. Um, so what we see here is we see this, this idea of, of 77s being decreed. Um, and it's basically giving us kind of a timeline. And it's actually really cool when you look at the history of it, how specific and precise mm -hmm. the timeline that was prophesied was given. So pretty much everyone seems to agree that the, the weeks or the sevens um, represent uh, years. So each week represents 70 years. So we have 70 weeks, each week being seven years. Do your math. It's 490 years. And we look at, basically it says from the time that um, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem is given, there will be 490 years. Now, the cool thing is just due to archaeological evidence, we know exactly when that decree was given for Jerusalem to be rebuilt. And it was 457 BC. Mm. Um, so this is... Um, <clears throat> This is exactly when that's given. So if you just kind of continue on with the math and, and follow the text there, we see um, it talks about 69 weeks, um, right? So 69 weeks was 483 years. Mm. If you count forward going from 457 BC, do your math, you arrive at Jesus' baptism, which was the beginning of his ministry. And how long was Jesus' ministry? It was three and a half years or half a week, half a week until the cross. So it's just... It's really cool to see how that how that how that was fulfilled. Um, now, generally speaking, the sort of classical understanding of this text was seeing Daniel's seventy weeks as something that was fulfilled uh, at the time of basically Christ's ministry, or like some people will put the actual dates. They'll say the first half week was uh, Jesus' earthly ministry. The second half week was from the church. 
uh, until I think it was Stevens stoning. Um, but regardless, what is going to be unique about a dispensationalist understanding um, is that they, this is where I mentioned earlier, the great parenthesis. So they're going to say that the 70 weeks of Daniel are not fulfilled. There was 69 weeks and then there was this pause, this stop, and then the 69th, uh, or the, the weeks are going to continue after the rapture. So that's their understanding. Um, now, one of the big uh, differences in this understanding, so let me read this here. Okay, so it says, after 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Um, and the people of the prince who shall come to destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, so again, so sort of some, some interesting history here. So the prince that came to destroy the city um, undoubtedly refers to Titus, who was a general of Rome mm -hmm. at the time. He was the one who destroyed Jerusalem in the year AD 70. Um, so it's very interesting that he was a prince, um, which again is is right there. Uh, but before that, it's talking about Jesus. It's saying Jesus is the anointed one. Uh, the anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Talking about the crucifixion here, Christ was cut off. And cut off also bears a lot of, linguistically, that goes along with the idea of, um, of covenant. Mm -hmm. Because the verb associated with the idea of a covenant was a cut. You cut a covenant. That was why they had like circumcision. It was a cutting of the covenant. That was sort of symbolic there. So it's, it's interesting that it, that it uses that word of being cut off. Um, so it says, and the people, uh, sorry, uh, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And uh, its end shall come with a flood. And to the end, there shall be war. Okay, there was the Roman Jewish war that took place in the late 60s there. And then it says desolations are decreed. Again, this was, we'll, we'll get into what happened in 70 AD down the road here. But it says, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half a week, he'll put an end to offering and sacrifice. Okay, so the question is, who is the he that it's talking about? He shall make a strong covenant with many for a week, and for half a week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. Again, classically, the, this he has been understood to be Jesus, right? Jesus um, puts an end to the sacrifice and the offering. Um, that's what he does. That's what he did on the cross. Um, so that's, again, that's the classic understanding. Now, the dispensationalists are going to say, well, no, the he actually refers to um, basically the Antichrist or an Antichrist um, type figure. And they're seeing this as a future covenant that's going to be fulfilled in the future where this Antichrist figure um, makes a covenant with, uh, with Israel. So again, who the he is is really going to dictate um, what uh, what we're talking about here. Um, I my personal opinion between this, I mean, I think you can just go back to the first verse here, which is verse twenty four. That says seventy weeks about your people are decreed in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end for sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness. Um, who did that? Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus did that. Jesus did that at the cross. So I think this is this is kind of a tough one for dispensationalists. I know this is going to be something that I'm going to be picking uh, when we have our, our dispensationalist scholar on. I really want to pick his brain here, see why sure. why he kind of comes up with that. But but yeah, that is a super important text um, for the, kind of uniquely for the uh, the dispensationalist. Okay, so. Uh, changing gears a bit, uh, we just talked uh, as far as premillennialism. Why don't we uh, switch gears and go to post millennialism? Cool. Uh, and kind of see where the big distinguishing factors are. Um, one of the things that I didn't get to ask, because um, you talked about Amel, Premill, all relating to the thousand. Do all of the views see the thousand years as a specific 1,000 years, or is there a distinction saying a very long time? Because I've heard quite a few different lectures on this, and even uh, in uh, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, he uh, proposes that uh, pre-mill uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a thousand years. It could be just a span of time. Mm -hmm. And that was something I hadn't really heard much when I've uh, listened to other pre-millennialists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think dispensational premillennials are going to be the most committed to a literal thousand. Again, just following their understanding of this literal interpretation being sort of the highest level of interpretation. Um, and right in the text, it says, you know, millennium and a thousand, I think mm -hmm. it's like six times in like 10 verses, it says this. So their, their basic thing is, well, this is what it says. So this is what it means. So they're going to, they're going to fight you tooth and nail on that. Uh, now, um, 
Yeah, my in my experience, usually historic premillennials do generally hold to a thousand as well. But I think they would probably be more open to it being just an extended period of time. Um, the post and the amillennial is not going to be the same at all. There uh, now again, postmillennial broadly would be post and amillennial. Mm-hmm. Um, both of those views are technically postmillennial. We'll get into the differences here in a minute. But but one difference is going to be amillennials are never going to say that it's exactly a thousand years. They're going to say uh, this is a symbolic number. It's in a symbolic book. Um, so there's there's no reason necessarily to interpret that as a specific exactly 1,000 in year time. And they would point to probably some texts like in the Old Testament where it talks about, okay, God owns the cattle on a thousand mm-hmm. hills. Or, you know, God will show mercy to a thousand generations. Like he's not excluding the thousand and first generation, right? It's just, sure. it's it's figurative language. And um, yeah, an amillennial or a postmillennial will be uh, much more comfortable with that. Um, so yeah, so let's, I've got a chart here for postmillennialism. But again, the, the key thing with postmillennialism is just that it's, it, the millennium is before Christ returns. Um, now, there's going to be some disagreements among postmillennials there. Some of them, sort of the, the more classic uh, postmillennials, postmillennialism had a lot of uh, footing in the uh, like 17 and 1800s. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of those original guys thought that it was going to be a literal thousand years um, and that the thousand years was going to start in the near future. Now, other guys in the postmillennial camp believe that the uh, thousand years quote unquote, began uh, when Christ was here on earth and it symbolically continues until he returns. Um, let me let me pull this up here. Okay, so here, here's just kind of some key points of postmillennialism. Um, so they are extremely optimistic. Um, postmillennialism is undoubtedly the most optimistic um, camp out there. They, they really see, um, they emphasize the physical effects of the gospel, right? So like what happens when people in droves come to Christ, Mm -hmm. like the culture has changed, the, the things get better. Science is better. Um, art is better, you know, and you can just look at as nations become Christianized, they get objectively and physically better. So that's going to be a big emphasis for a post-millennial. Um, Again, that's the sort of the physical benefits to evangelism. Um, what they're looking for is for the nations to be Christianized. So whereas, especially dispensationalists, uh, but really more, the other camps in general are far less optimistic. They're going to focus more on the trials, sort of things getting worse and worse, whereas a post-millennial is going to say that overall the thrust of the church age is things getting better, mm-hmm. um, typically until this sort of great uh, apostasy uh, that, that takes place Towards the end, when Satan is uh, when Satan is loose, let me see if I what else I have uh, to supplement that. Um, okay, so one thing that we had there. See, this is why I wanted to do the different views first <laughs> before we got into this. Okay, so so one thing we had in there is that post millennials are generally preterist, um, and that's a term that we haven't defined yet. <laughs> Do you want to do you want to just go and kind of ramp into some of that? So that let's do that here. and then pop right back here. Let's do that. So uh, when we're looking at post mill, ah uh, mill, pre mill, we have uh, several different ways of kind of uh, interpreting and looking through those texts, and some of that's kind of the presuppositions that we bring into it. But uh, traditionally, you have the futurist view, the preterist, the historicist, and the idealist. So if you can quickly kind of break those matters down. And how they impact as far as uh, how uh, w- what camp essentially we end up being with it. Yeah, yeah. So um, the first, and this is probably going to be the most familiar um, position to you guys. That's the futurist view. Mm-hmm. Um, the futurist view sees the eschatological events predicted in the Bible, primarily Revelation, uh, as primarily future events. They were future to the audience they were written to, and they're still future to us today. Um, so this again generally emphasizes a literal or a literalistic um, hermeneutic. Um, so, for example, if you read Revelation, assuming that it's all or primarily future, you're going to see, okay, uh, it talks about a temple mm-hmm. in the future. So, well, if there's a temple in the future, then it must be that there is there's going to be a temple rebuilt in Israel. And that's why there is so much focus for a lot of particularly dispensational um, Christians towards looking for a temple to be rebuilt um, because they're assuming uh, that it is a literal temple because it's talked about, again, they're going to emphasize the literalism uh, of it and the futurism of it. That it is something, something that is future. Um, I like the futurist view just because it's really exciting. And like we, you know, like we have a place in it. 
uh, so to speak. Um, and it, it's kind of less falsifiable than others uh, in that you could just kind of say, well, it still hasn't come to pass yet. Whereas if you go with a preterist view, which we'll look at next, um, you have some more obstacles that you're you're mm-hmm. kind of faced with there. Um, now, the, the downside of the futurist view, to me, probably the biggest downside to that view is that I think it really kind of lacks relevance to the original audience as well as to most generation of Christians. Mm -hmm. Uh, For example, if when you get into Revelation, um, you know, you're talking about the mark of the beast that's some microchip and stuff like that, it's like, okay, what meaning would that have had to Christians for the first, you know... 2,000 years. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And I think it kind of takes relevance off of there. And when you read Revelation, you know, it starts out where John is you know, like he's, he's talking to his brothers and sisters and he identifies himself as partaking in their suffering and in their trials and tribulations. And, and I, I, that's, that's, I guess my biggest downside, um, is that I think it's, it would be really hard to have any understanding of revelation prior to it, it actually kind of happening. If you were to take a a futurist, Mm -hmm. uh, view now, now Contra, the futurist view is the preterist view. Um, and the preterist view is generally what the post mill view is. So preterism basically views, uh, rather than most of these events to be in the future, it views most of them to be in the past. So they would say uh, that most of these eschatological events actually were fulfilled within the lifetime of the apostles or shortly following that. Uh, so it views most of Revelation at this point as a uh, future to it being written, but history to us today. Um, so one of the things that it hinges on is an early date of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, when you look at, okay, what date was a book written? Most of the time with scripture, it doesn't really matter all that much, but it matters tremendously to a preterist view because uh, sort of the general age, if you look at, you know, if you, if you grab most of your Bibles that, you know, most study Bibles and you look at Revelation, it's going to tell you that it was written probably in 95 AD or or sometime around there. Mm -hmm. Um, that is the majority position. Now there is the minority position, which is preterists are going to hold on to, and that's going to they're going to argue no, it wasn't written that late. It was actually written uh, around sixty seven A D. Yeah. And there, there's an interesting debate that I saw on that. I think it was uh, Hank Hanegraaff and oh the other dude's name slips me, but they were basically arguing and debating over the date of it. And uh, and I've done some more research. Other than that, I I tend to lean towards the majority view. I think ninety five probably fits a little bit better, but it could go either way. Like it's not something that I would be hardcore committed to, uh, mm-hmm. to one way or the other. I think it'd be good at this stage just so that if some of our viewers go looking for like good, uh, uh post-millennial views and there's there's a big distinction between what's called full preterism oh, and then yeah. partial preterism so if you can explain why typically full preterism is seen as pure heresy yeah so so yeah so full preterism and partial preterism what we're talking about here is partial preterism uh that means that part of or you know probably in most cases the majority of these views uh or, or the things written in you know revelation matthew 24 and some of these other texts the majority of that has already been fulfilled, but we're still awaiting the second coming of Christ. We're still awaiting the new heavens and the new earth. We're still awaiting the eternal state, things like that. Uh, Full preterism is going to say, nope, everything's done. Everything was fulfilled. We're in the new heavens and the new earth now. This is the eternal state. Um, It's viewed as as a heretical thing, and we're not even gonna gonna mess with it just because it's it's so it just it denies so many core tenets of um of the christian faith so again uh what we're talking about here is is the the partial preterist um view but uh, so again the partial preterists are going to say that revelation was written um pre 70 ad so they're going to say probably sometime in the 60s 67 somewhere in there um and uh, you know, that really affects how you understand the Bible, because if it was written then, it's hard to say that it wasn't written about the events that were taking mm-hmm. place right then. Uh, so, for example, in Revelation, it talks about how uh, the beast will have the authority to persecute the church for 42 months. And when you look at the history of what was going on there, uh, Nero, whose name can be written as 666, you know, the beast, uh he began to persecute the church. We have a specific date for it because it was around the time when a fire was started in Rome. He was blamed for it. He said, oh, I didn't start the fire. It was the Christians. He began a persecution on the Christians that lasted up until his death, which was 42 months later. Um, there's just, there's a lot of really interesting things. Like I, to be honest, I'm not convinced that, that, that this is the best approach, at least of revelation. I would kind of lean away from it a little bit, but I think it's fascinating to look at the history and look at those parallels uh, of like, you know, Nero and the beast and, and things like that. It's really fascinating. 
Um, I, I'm excited to get our, our preterist guy in here just to pick his brain on some of it. Cause again, Definitely. it's just, that's fascinating stuff. Okay. So that's, so we have futurism, uh, all down the road. We have preterism. Uh, most of it's behind us. Um, Okay, I would say, so a negative about preterism, probably my biggest downside to preterism is just that it really hinges on an early date of revelation, and I don't really like that. <laughs> like, again, like, I think that I think a decent case for that can be made, um, but I don't like that. And then I guess the other thing is, whereas uh, the futurism kind of isolates uh, the majority of Christians minus the future generation that sees it all, preterism almost does the opposite, because... Uh, you know, okay, that makes it extremely relevant to its original audience. But then to us, you know, we just, we have to look at it differently. Mm-hmm. If this is recording symbolically a bunch of linear historical events. Um, so I, I would say that's um, kind of another downside. Um, now, one we're not going to spend much time in is the historicist view. Um, rather than it being primarily past, primarily future, historicism says that revelation is basically a description of the entire church age. Um, this is a view that was popular towards the end of the Middle Ages from about 1100 to 1400 or so this was this was kind of a kind of a popular view but the the biggest downside to that I guess it makes it nice because we can look for our place in revelation hey where are we in this book um, but on the downside you have to completely reinterpret it like every couple centuries or you know like when history doesn't go the way that you know you thought it would or whatever like it's just it's it's a tough one again that's not one we're gonna spend much time on um, for that reason. And then the last view that we're going to talk about is the idealist view. Um, the idealist view is going to look at these look at these texts with a heavy emphasis on the analogy of faith. So on that method that says, let's let scripture interpret scripture. So anytime you go to a number or a certain uh, image that we're given in Revelation, it's going to go and look back, where have we seen these images before? And really, it's going to understand this text symbolically uh, more than anything else, uh, specifically, again, the book of Uh, the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Um, And then one other thing that's usually going to be common of the idealist is they're generally going to see the book of Revelation rather than a linear story. Okay, first this, then this, then this, then this. They're going to see them as parallel events. So they're going to see them almost as, like if you watch a football game and it switches up the different camera angles. So it shows you, okay, so here is, you're watching this play from, you know, looking right down the line of scrimmage. Okay, now we're going to switch. You're going to look at the same play, but from the view of the quarterback. Okay, now you're going to see from, uh, you know, the wide receiver, whatever. So so it's just, it looks at the text differently. And again, it's like, which of these approaches you take, whether you're idealist, futurist, preterist, um, is really going to determine where you land on, okay, what does the millennium look like? Where, you know, how, how do we interpret these other things? Um, so now that we've kind of laid the groundwork for gosh, that. Gosh, that's so much. we go back to the post-mill position. Yeah. Um, like being that a lot of the events are seen as, you know, historical events that would happen, what are some of the key texts that post-millennialists rely on uh, when looking through that lens? Um, so they're, they're going to look at a lot of, a lot of the parables. Um, so they're going to look at, for example, like the parable of the mustard seed, how it's this small thing that just eventually grows and, and mm-hmm. takes over. And they're, they're going to say, you know, that's the kingdom of God. That's the church on this earth. You know, when you look at, okay, how many Christians were there in, in the year 100 AD? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like several thousand probably. But it's like, you know, when you when you look at Christianity over the course of history, like it really did expand everywhere. So they're going to they're going to kind of see that. Um, In that context, a a big one for them is going to be uh, the scripture where Jesus says um, the gates of the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. They're going to look at that and say, "Okay, hang on. It's not the world here that's uh, barging in on the church because a gate is a defensive weapon. The gates of hell will not prevail against the onslaught of the church. So they're seeing the church as ultimately continually taking ground. Um, And uh, that's. Yeah, that, that's going to be a big one. So again, this was a, this was a very popular view um, around the 17 and 1800s. And what you had happening then was the the globe really was being evangelized. Prior to that, it was more central to Europe and things like that. Uh, but then in the 17 and 1800s, like missionary work spread everywhere. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of them, th- those classic post mill guys, um, Jonathan Edwards and and dudes like that, um, you know, they saw them almost kind of the missionary work would usher in this golden age. Um, this this golden millennial age that would lead up to Christ coming back. Um, we, we also see a, a sort of an awakening of 
uh, post-millennialism, like in the 1980s. Um, and you have to think, you know, okay, like Reagan administration, like, you know, things are looking up for, um, for conservative Christians and, and things like that. So it's, uh, a lot of the views are really kind of, you know, when you, when you stand back and look at it, you can say, okay, what's going on in this cultural context that would make someone want to interpret it that way or another, um, you know, and same thing with like, uh, like the, a lot of the early church fathers, the, the historic pre-mill guys were kind of pessimistic on that. And it was like, okay, what were they going through at the time? Like martyrdom, death, like, you know, they were getting destroyed. And then, uh, by the time Rome was Christianized in the third century or Christianity became the, the fourth century, excuse me, um, when Christianity became the official religion, it's like, okay, that, that maybe changes up our, our perspective a little bit of what, what exactly this is, uh, this is supposed to look like. So in the post mill view, you've got, you know, um, Ephesians 1's got to be a primary text where they're looking at Christ uh, reigning and ruling at the right hand, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they're, they're really going to emphasize the reign of Christ now, which I think, again, that's a hard thing to, to argue against that Christ is reigning now. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of the I think it was the last time, last time I preached a sermon, I think it was on the Ascension. It might've been two times ago, but looking at the Ascension of Christ, uh, you know, we can think of it as kind of a weird event, but looking at it in context, looking at it in the context of Daniel uh, chapter nine, the prophecy where you have, um, you know, the one who's like a son of man uh, going and lifting up and sitting at the right hand of, of God, the father, and then he's being given this dominion and kingdom. Um, so, so again, that's for post millennials, they're really going to emphasize that Christ is reigning now. Mm-hmm. Um, and all millennials are going to argue that as well. They're just not going to be quite as optimistic about what that looks like physically. They're going to focus more on, okay, well, yes, we are reigning spiritually, but we're also being overcome and defeated physically as persecution continues and, and things like that. Uh, I do have a little, a graph here for yeah, no, nope, that's not what I meant to put on. Um, we have our post mill chart here. There we go. So we can see, okay, so the millennium, um, literal or not, it says at the beginning, the start of the millennium is debatable. Again, the majority of post millennials that I'm aware of are going to say that the millennium started uh, in Christ's earthly ministry. So when Christ came to earth, he set up the kingdom. He started that millennium. And then that continues until he returns. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at his return is, you know, the judging of the living and the dead, um, new heavens and new earth, all that good stuff. Um, so that's going to be sort of a basic breakdown of of that view there now being that you were talking about uh the date of revelation being a big uh factor uh being before 70 a.d um obviously that's probably uh, an allude to uh the destruction uh, and the fall of jerusalem correct Mm -hmm. yeah so what is that meaning that the primary text that the uh, post mill, and I'm not sure on the ah mill because I haven't studied that one quite as much. But uh, would that be Matthew 24? Um, yeah, that's going to be a big one, and we'll, uh, pre- we'll 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 break that down here in a little bit. Matthew 24 is is referred to as the Olivet Discourse, and that's there. There's parallel. It's in um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke is the same sermon, sort of from diff- three different vantage points. Okay. But that's when Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple. He's talking about, um, you know, judgment and, and all this stuff. And yeah, the the, uh, the post-millennials, uh, being generally preterists, are going to see um, going to see Matthew 24 as for fulfilling a lot of that, that judgment thing. They're going to say that, that that's past, that was fulfilled mm-hmm. um, in AD 70. Again, we'll, we'll break that down a little bit more uh, shortly here. Um, do we want to move to A-Mill? Yeah, let's go A-mil. ahead and go to cool. that one. Um, so again, so A-Mill is, whereas dispensationalists were really heavy on the grammatical historical, A-Mills are going to be very uh, heavy on the analogy of faith. Um, again, on letting scripture interpret scripture, let's let the plain text interpret the um, the more complex or, or confusing texts. Uh, but again, they're going to emphasize, they don't have the, the optimism of post-millennials, generally speaking. They're going to look at spiritual triumph, but spiritual triumph is also coming amidst physical tribulation. Um, and as we look through church history, I mean, it's riddled with the church being persecuted. I don't remember which of the early fathers was it Justin Martyr, maybe, who said that the, the blood of the saints is the seed of the church? You know, just as we see, you know, our brothers and sisters getting mowed down, that's where God's working. That's where revival is happening. Um, and that happens still today. Um, so a big thing with the amillennial position is that they're going to see uh, parallels as opposed to linear in the book of Revelation specifically. So rather than, again, one timeline, this happens, then this, then this, 
they're going to see these all lined up, like I explained a second ago about mm-hmm. so sort of looking at the same play in a football game from seven different camera angles. That's going to be how they are. Um, they're going to focus on what they call the uh, the now and the not yet. Um, so meaning when we look at the kingdom of God, we see that it's here. Like Jesus was very clear, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God has come upon you. When you see demons being cast out, you will know that the kingdom has come upon you. So it's here. Uh, but at the same time, there's still a not yet element. It's still waiting Christ to come back. Um, and, you know, you look at even the Lord's Prayer. We pray, um, your kingdom come, right? We realize that the fullness of the kingdom is not here. It's here in part, but it's awaiting uh, the consummation or, or Christ. Uh, handing that that kingdom over uh, when he comes back, again, according to the Amil view. Um, we see yeah, Christ ruling now. Um, we see, uh, we, mentioned, we mentioned Revelation 20 um, and sort of this idea of the first, the, it talks about the first resurrection and a second resurrection and things like that. So Amils are generally going to see the first resurrection as the spiritual resurrection of the individual. Um, so like in John 5, Jesus talks about that, you know, if you passed from death to life, you've, you've been saved, you've, you've moved over this. They're going to see the first resurrection as not a physical thing, like some of the futurists will, where they'll see, okay, there's actually going to be two resurrections in the future. They're going to say, no, one of them was spiritual. That's the one that happens when we believe in Christ. And then the next one is, um, when, when Christ returns, um, we see again, this position got a lot of steam as early as the second century. This was if there was ever a majority view, probably for most of the church age, I would say that it would be the Amil view. Yeah. Um, it's not anymore. Dispensationalism has really, especially the last hundred years or so, dispensationalism is very dominant. But throughout the church age, um, amillennialism has been probably the, the most common. Um, so one thing that they're really going to focus on is uh, really a framework that they're going to operate from is the two-age model. Um, so they're going to say that scripture very clearly paints that there are two ages. There's the present age and there's the future age or the age to come. Uh, I encourage you guys to do a word study on that. It's fascinating to look up look up some of the stuff there, but to give just sort of a couple examples. So in the what does the Bible say about the present age? It's an evil age. Uh, people are married or given in marriage. It's an age of homes, fields, and families. Uh, the riches of the age will be no benefit in the age to come. Um Things like that. So what do we see this is being categorized? This is all physical things, right? Now is the time when we have stuff and we have families and we have, right, it's all this, it's material, uh, temporal things. And then that's contrasted with the age to come, which on the flip side, there's no marriage or no given in marriage. Um, You know, it says that he who has life, uh, that is truly life in the age to come. Uh, It's not inherited by the wicked, uh, etc. So, so what, what they're going to argue is that the age to come is the eternal state. That's the new heavens and the new earth. That is not categorized by our age um, that we are in right now. And because of that, um, they are going to equate the present age also with the kingdom of God. Um, so, so they're seeing now as now is the kingdom. The kingdom has been here. Jesus set up the kingdom. He's going to come back and consummate the kingdom. Um, And there isn't any room in a model like that. And I think, again, I think you can make a really good argument for this, but there isn't room in a model for that for an intermediate state that would be like what a future millennium would be. You know, if you look at either dispensational or a classical premillennial view or even a postmillennial view of a golden age or something, it's like that's not really that doesn't fit anywhere in either this age or in the age to come. Um, in terms of if you're looking at that as a, as a time frame in between. Um, so one one big text I want to bring up um, is 1 Corinthians. Um, 1 Corinthians 15 says, For as an Adam all die, so also Christ shall be made alive, but each at his own order. Christ the first fruits, and then it is coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom over to the kingdom of God to the Father after destroying every rule uh, and feet, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Um, So again here, what they're going to see in this text, this is actually pointing back to Psalm 110 verse 1. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's the most quoted text in all the Bible. It says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So what they're going to say is Christ is ruling now. We can't really debate that Christ is ruling now. And this text says that he is, he is ruling and he will continue to rule until he has put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
So again, the idea of a, of a millennial age that's in there um, just doesn't seem to doesn't seem to square with that. Mm-hmm. Again, that's one that you know when we have our our uh, pre millennial guys, that's I'm going to be curious to pick their brain on that. But that's that's going to be one of the key uh, AML texts there that we're going to look at. Uh, definitely. So um, from there, what would you say is uh, the key thing? The major theme of all of the various groups, where there's uh, the point of unity, the return, of, the bodily return of Christ. I would say the bodily return of Christ and the um, the final judgment. I think all the camps agree on that. They all agree that believers will be in the new heavens and the new earth for eternity following that. Mm -hmm. It's really what we're arguing is just how the middle part works out. We all agree, okay, here's here's where the end is, um, but we don't necessarily agree of what that's going to look like until we get there. So that's really kind of what what the debates are on that. Uh, So let's see. We've pretty much uh, gone over the uh, three primary views. Um, uh, and you've been studying this uh, for a lot longer than I have. So what are some of the key texts that have impacted your view and kind of uh, uh, put you where you're at right now, I guess? Um, a big one for me, and I think this is it, maybe even more so than, than what's in Revelation, maybe even more so than like Revelation 20, where it actually talks about the millennium would be Matthew 24. And we mentioned that a few minutes ago, the Olivet Discourse. Um, and this is shortly before um, Christ is betrayed and, and crucified, and he is uh, he's predicting a bunch of things. And he's talking about this is the signs of the end of the age. These are the things that are going to come, you know, antichrists and, uh, and things like that. And you will be delivered over to courts and killed. And, you know, and then he says all these things um, will take place, and this generation won't pass away until they do. So that's a big one. So let's maybe just... If you want to read through Matthew 24, I know it's a lot of verses, Hold but on. just starting in verse one there. <laughs> All right. So Jesus left the temple and was going away when his uh, disciples came to point out to him buildings in the temple. Uh, but he answered them, you see all these, uh, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when all these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation, put you to death, and you will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, Pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So, if they say to you, Look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man, wherever the corpse is there our vultures will gather. 
Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. <laughs> and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree, learn its lesson as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that it is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. It's a lot of text. Super a lot of text. <laughs> Super a lot of text. Uh, but that, that's the Olivet Discourse. And again, there's, um, I think it's Luke 21 and Mark 13. There's, there's parallels. And uh, there's, I mean, I've listened to a lot of sermons on those, you know, but um, yeah, they're, they're just from three different angles. This is probably the fullest one in Matthew 24, so that was why we went with this one. But uh, just to kind of break that down a little bit. Um, so we have in verse 2, we have Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. So they're standing outside the temple, and he's telling his disciples, there's not going to be another brick on top of a brick here. This is gone. Like, this thing is going. And then in verse 3, the disciples ask, well, hey, when is that going to happen? And what what is the sign of the end of the age? Um, so when we get here, one of the questions we have to ask, I think, in verse 3, so it's saying, when will this happen and what the, what, <laughs> wow, and what the sign of the age is, is this two separate questions or is it one? Um, and some people are going to say that it's one. Uh, generally, uh, more of a preterist understanding is going to say, okay, this is one event that we're talking about here. Um, and I think it's I think it's kind of tough to say that that's wrong just because he says at the end, all these things will come to pass and this generation will not pass away. Um, but again, there, there are people who would say, like a lot of people in the uh, Amil camp, would say that, okay, he's actually going to be doing two different prophecies here. One that's short-term, one that's long-term. Okay, so just, just kind of have that in mind as we as we go to here. And then the other thing is the sign of the end of the age. So again, from an amillennial perspective, the end of the age is the end of all things uh, temporal. That's the present evil age. That's what, he's, that's what he's looking at. Now, where preterists are really going to distinguish is they're generally going to see that as referring to the Jewish age, not the age of mankind. Mm -hmm. So they're going to see the destruction of the temple in AD 70 as the stamped, definitive, this is the end of the Jewish age. So that's what they're looking at. So again, these presuppositions are going to kind of determine uh, how we understand this text here. Um, and Jesus goes on, verses 5 through 14, he talks about all the signs that have to happen. I think preterists do have a good argument to say that they did happen in that generation, um, you know, talking about false prophets and things like that. There's, I think it's Eusebius lists a number of known mm -hmm. false prophets that were there in, that, in the first century and, uh, you know, and all these other things, even false miracles and things like that are, are recorded to have happened. Um, uh, within that generation. Uh, then in verse 14, it talks about how the gospel has to go to all nations um, before these things happen. So, okay, so what do you what do you mean by that? And how literal are you going to be? Again, if you're going to be extremely literal, you're probably going to say, well, the, the gospel didn't go into all the nations in the first century. That hasn't really happened until the last few hundred years, where now we have Christianity mm -hmm. on every continent in you know, the majority of the countries and things like that. Um, however, when you look at the analogy of faith and say, okay, well, what else does Scripture say about this? How does it inform us? You can read like Colossians 1. It says, uh, Paul says, This gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. So which way are you going to play that? You know, are you going to say, okay, well, that could could have been fulfilled uh, within that that immediate age or not? Obviously, Paul here is probably talking about the whole Roman world, um, but regardless, okay. Uh, verse fifteen, he talks about when you see the abomination of desolation. Uh, this is what Jesus says. The abomination of desolation is again going back to Daniel nine uh, that we read earlier. Now, an interesting thing is so again, Luke and Matthew record this same this same uh, discourse, the same speech by Christ. But Luke, who wrote to a more Gentile audience, he didn't say the abomination of desolation. That's something that Jews would have been very familiar with, but Gentiles probably not so much. Uh, he says, when you see the city surrounded, uh, run for the hills. Uh, not when you see the abomination of desolation run for the hills. That's just interesting. But he says, flee Judea. 
Okay, Judea would, that was a specific region. Mm -hmm. So that would give merit to the idea of this being a regional trouble and not a global trouble. Um, again, the, the, the futurist understanding, typically a premillennial, is going to say that this, all this stuff has not happened yet. This is still going to happen in the future. Um, but again, verse 16 says, flee Judea. Well, if it's a global persecution, worst tribulation ever in the world, fleeing Judea probably you know, might not do a whole lot for you. Uh, but then it's kind of interesting because in verse 22, it says, if the times were not cut short, no human being would it be saved. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, well, that would kind of lead credence to maybe it is global. But I think... Again, I'm just, just giving you thinking points here and stuff to study. Um, so, yeah, so no, no human being would be saved. Uh, no, oh, wow. Now, looking at the, uh, the parallels of what actually happened here in this tribulation. Um, so Jesus predicted this around 30 AD mm -hmm. is when he said this. And Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, records for us the events that took place 40 years later in AD 70, uh, Jewish-Roman War. And, and I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but Josephus records that the city was surrounded by Rome. They pulled back. The Christians, he said, having been privy to a uh, some kind of a prophecy, the Christians all left the city. Mm -hmm. um, and then the army that had pulled back came back in. Uh, sieged the city and utterly destroyed them. Um, utterly see, like he he records some of the horrors that happened there, and it is, I mean, it's difficult to read. You don't you talk about starvation and cannibalism. There's a, an account of a of a mother who killed her infant and cut him in half and ate one portion and gave his portion to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, the the cannibalism was. Uh, it's recorded that people would, if they saw someone who looked healthy so they didn't look starved, they would actually kill the people and rip open their insides to try and collect the food uh, that was digesting in them. Like, it's horrible. Like, this, there was a, over a million people dead, well over a million. Uh, there's records of rivers of blood flowing through the city. Um, they said that it even quenched burning houses and things like that. There was so much blood. Uh, the temple was utterly destroyed. And you actually, today, to see the ruins of the temple, you have to go 50 feet underground. Um, so it's it, it really was um, mm -hmm. utterly destroyed. And an interesting thing, too, is that Titus, the, again, the prince of, of Daniel 9, um, actually said when he made it into the city, he basically said, God is my witness, I didn't do this. Like, you guys were judged by a god. Like, I, I didn't do this horror. So it's, you know, just interesting. So, okay, here's a Roman general, like, dude, seen destruction and death and, and things like that. But so, so these events really did happen. And I think that's a really cool apologetic, too, because you have, okay, Jesus saying, hey, the temple's going to be destroyed, and this generation won't pass away until that happens. Then you have literally 40 years, <laughs> you know, to the year later, this temple is destroyed. Um, so continuing on, so verses 29 through 31, we have a lot of apocalyptic language. Um, and a lot of it does go back to what else was in Daniel. Again, Jesus had just sort of quoted Daniel, so it makes sense that he's alluding to these other these other references in Daniel. Some of the other ones are in Isaiah. Uh, for example, you know, he he says that he's going to come back, uh, you know, on the clouds, riding on a cloud. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, for example, it talks about how uh, I think it's in Isaiah. I forget the reference, but it says that um, that Yahweh came riding on a swift cloud to Egypt, and it was just, it's judgment language. We don't have any evidence that there was any sort of physical manifestation of that. It was just God was coming to judge them next. Um, so a uh, someone in the, the preterist camp is going to really interpret this language very symbolic um, in, in terms of this, this kind of this language that's here, and he's going to say, well, yeah, that was fulfilled again in AD 70. And then it was, you know, what Jesus is talking about here isn't his final return and judgment. What he's talking about is judging the wicked generation um, that uh, that put him to death and, and things like that. Um, so again, preterists are going to say this was fulfilled in the first century. Futurists generally are not. Now, it's kind of interesting looking at like the amillennial uh, camp. They tend to see uh, remember one of the first things I mentioned was, is it sort of one prophecy or two? Mm -hmm. So they're going to say that there's two, that there's the first one is when's the temple going to be destroyed and all that stuff that we just said happened, that's fulfilled. But then there's also this future, um, a future fulfillment of the rest of the prophecy of the end of the age. Um, and that's, what's going to be depictive of, uh, of that sort of thing. Um, 
Getting into verse 34, he says, this generation won't pass away. You know, the question then is, okay, well, what do you mean exactly by this generation? So looking at the word, the word linguistically could mean age uh, or uh, a time span of a people. Mm -hmm. um, it could mean, you know, it, it could mean a variety of different things. However, every single time in the Bible it's used, it's meant to mean a specific generation. And I think that's, if you're going to say that it's not that, it's extra problematic because just a few verses before in Matthew 23, Jesus was declaring woe upon this generation. And he said, you know, this this wicked generation. And you also have the uh, the parable of um, the king. Oh, shoot. I wrote that. I don't know where that was. <laughs> um, but yeah, just the, the parable of uh, you know, they, they killed the king's messengers and the king said, surely they won't, they'll listen to my son. And then they killed his son. So he goes and then destroys them. And so, so they would say that eighty seventy is again, a fulfillment of that. Um, it seems like each of the camps, uh, at times kind of pick and choose when they want things to be symbolic or when they want right. things to be literal. Right. Same with that going back to the thousand years. Right. Uh, in that case, you know, the post millennial will say, well, that's just a span of time. And then mm -hmm. the pre uh, mills will say, no, it's specifically, you know, a thousand as far as the dis uh, dispensational premillennialism. Yeah. And so I, I think that's uh, another area where there's <laughs> some similarities between the different groups. It's not that no, they're all taking scripture very seriously. They have high regard for it. And I right. think that's something to be, um, you know, understood by those that go into the study of this is that um, – each one of these camps takes scripture very, very seriously. Yes. Yes. Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Um, and yeah, and on that, so for the generation, so now futurists, specifically the dispensational futurists are going to take a different twist on this generation. They're going to say this generation here actually refers to um, a future generation. Um, and generally speaking, so back in the 80s, there was a lot of big literature. There was a book that came out called, I think it was 88 Reasons the Rapture Will Happen in 1988. And basically the underlying framework of that is Israel became a nation again in 1948. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing your math and a generation is 40 years, which is the most common number for that, okay, all these things are going to come to pass in that generation. And then there was a lot of recalculations and then it was, oh, I think it was actually 1989. We missed our, <laughs> you know, we missed our thing, but those... Um, but yeah, so that's what a, a futurist is generally going to say is that this, or at least a dispensationalist would usually say that this generation refers to a future one. Um, again, I'm, I, I have a tough time with that because Jesus didn't say that generation. He says this generation. And, mm -hmm. uh, also considering that he had just declared woe upon this generation, uh, in the chapter before. Um, yeah, and I, I like the uh, sort of the amillennial view of seeing a double fulfillment of, okay, here's a, sort of a shadow and then there's a long term down the road. I just, and this is again something that I want to pick these dudes' brains on that we get on the show. Mm -hmm. Okay, so linguistically, where do you draw the line? Like, how could you, reading that text, say, okay, here's where he stopped talking about the temple and then here's where he started talking about uh, sort of this future thing? So, again, we're hoping to dive into that more when we get, uh, when we get people on. Um, yeah, I think we froze on that. We're still, yeah, this uh, is lost you at 108. Uh-oh. I think we've reconnected, yeah? Let me see here. Yeah, I think, uh, in theory, we're, we're still connected. Okay, yeah, we're back. Minor, minor tech issue. Hopefully it's not too bad. We'll post this thing on YouTube, uh, as well. So if you guys missed, uh, something important, um, you'll be able to catch back up with that. Um, so, but yes, yeah, so that's Matthew 24. So that's one of the most important, um, texts to eschatology that there is, uh, for sure. And it's, uh, really just a fascinating, uh, fascinating one. Um, I know we've been going for a while, but you want to do one more, uh, one more text? Uh, yeah. So what is the significance to Romans 11? Romans 11. So, you know, and it, it's tough for us to just look at these small texts because they, always fall in line with something else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're always, they're following something and they're leading into something else. Um, but Romans 11 is where it talks about um, sort of God's plan for Jews and Gentiles and how exactly does that work? And um, well, well, I guess we, we might as well read the text, but, but basically where Paul is in the book of Romans as he has 
basically said, okay, God's great. He's fulfilling all these promises. And then the question is, well, wait a minute. What about, uh, what about Israel? Like if, if God is really fulfilling his promises, if he's really saving people, why is it that so many ethnic Jews who are supposed to be his people uh, aren't believing in Christ? Mm-hmm. And they're actually the ones who are persecuting Christ in the church. Um, so, so that's kind of what, what he is dealing with there. If you want to just dive into the text and then we'll, we won't do as, as in-depth of a breakdown here as we did in the last one, but we'll, yeah. we'll kind of view, cause this is another one that there's at least a few different perspectives and we can see how our, our presuppositions are going to, going to fall in here. For sure. So it starts off, it says, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous, and thus save some of them. For if the rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins." Cool. So, so yeah, again, we're, we're not going to go crazy with uh, picking this apart, but um, we're going to point out some key things that are really going to affect how you understand a text like this. Um, so we're talking about a partial hardening has come to Israel uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So the way that a dispensationalist is going to read this text is, is they're going to say, okay, partial hardening has come on Israel. That was Israel's unbelief. Again, here's the great parenthesis, okay? God basically says, okay, I'm done dealing with Israel for right now. I'm going to focus on the Gentiles. He saves a Gentile church. He then pulls the Gentile church out of the world. That's the rapture. And then resumes uh, his saving of, of Israel, of ethnic Israel. So that's going to be kind of the way that they are going to read that. Um, now, a historic pre-mill, remember, historic pre-mills don't necessarily see as sharp of a distinction um, between Jews or believing Jews and um, believing Gentiles. Um, so they're more going to see this as a um, ethnic Jews and ethnic Gentiles together fulfilling the same redemptive plan. Mm-hmm. Um, again, it's just, it's kind of where is God's focus? Okay, so God's focus right now is on the Gentiles. He's then going to turn the focus and save a large number of the Jews. Um, and then they will together inherit the millennial kingdom, um, the Jewish and the Gentile church. Um, now, uh, in the amillennial camp, people are kind of split on the role of uh, a future for ethnic Israel, uh, but they do generally affirm a future for Jewish revivals. So they're not going to say that Israel has a, a distinct redemptive plan like a dispensationalist will, because the dispensationalists will say that uh, the believing Gentiles or the, the believers of the church age are actually coming back to rule in the millennial kingdom. Um, and the millennial kingdom, the main ones getting the benefit from that are the Jews. Um, so, so again, that's kind of where the distinction is, but, uh, again, the amillennials, uh, see, you know, the Jews and Gentiles, those that believe as part of the same body, part of the same covenant. Um, and they get, they get accused a lot of times. Sometimes you'll hear the word replacement theology, uh, get thrown out. Um, and basically what someone means when they say replacement theology is, oh, well, you believe that God promised all this good stuff to Abraham's descendants or to Jews. But then God pulled the plug on that and said, nope, you're out. I, the church is in, um, right? So God's people has been replaced. It's not Jews anymore. It's now Gentiles. That's replacement theology. Um, that that I hate that term because I think it just, um, it's, it's just a complete misunderstanding. Like, I don't think I've ever met any amillennial or whatever who actually believes that. Um, a better term would be fulfillment theology. They would see the church as fulfilling those promises, but not by themselves. It's 
they would use, I mean, using the words of Roman 11 of being grafted in. The Gentiles are grafted into not a different body with a different future. They're grafted into the same body with the same future, the same, the same tree. Um, so again, like I just cringe whenever I hear someone say replacement theology, because that just usually means that they don't really, <laughs> they haven't really studied what it is they're, they're disagreeing with. Um, one thing I did find interesting is that many post-millennials see the Jewish conversion as the start of the golden age or the start of the millennial kingdom. Um, yeah, that, that was something that I found, hmm. I found interesting, but, um, yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, uh, we kind of laid a good, uh, groundwork for what we have coming. Um, if you want to lay out, uh, who, who are we seeing first? What's the first? We got, uh, out? Dr. Kim Riddlebarger coming on in two weeks. Um, and he is an amillennial theologian, uh, brilliant dude, uh, super witty. I think we're, we're going to have a good time with him. Uh, that's going to be fun. Um, hashtag so, riddle me this hashtag riddle me this, um, Okay, one thing I do want to add, and I should have I should have said this sooner, but uh, so we talked initially about how with the question of the millennium is the timing and the substance, um, and the substance is what what does the millennium actually mean? So it talks about say, Satan being bound, but what does that mean? What is he free and not free to do? And again, the text isn't necessarily super descriptive, but it says that he's he's not free to deceive the nations anymore. Mm -hmm. So a very common objection to an ah uh, or post millennialism is. The devil obviously isn't chained up somewhere. He's running around alive and well. You know, you got everything you got going on in the world with pedophile rings and, you know, just crazy, you know, whatever happening. Like the devil's not bound. Um, but when you look at that, when you look at the text of, uh, of Revelation 20, it's not really talking about that for the sake of individuals. It's saying that he's bound from deceiving the nations, basically. So if you look at, okay, what did the salvation of people on earth look like before Christ came? It was like, okay, the believers are pretty much just a minority or a part of one nation. Mm -hmm. And then at the coming of Christ, and there's amillennials, we'll, we'll throw out a lot of different verses. They'll, they'll use like the parable of Jesus saying, you know, you must bind up the strong man before you plunder his house. And they would say that's referring to the kingdom. When Jesus came, he bound Satan, and then he, now he's plundering his house. Now he's saving people from every tongue and tribe, every nation that had formerly been under the dominion. Uh, of Satan. Um, we see in like John 12, it talks about when Jesus is lifted up, uh, Satan will be cast out. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what it's, what it's looking at. And then like Hebrews two would say that the devil's power was weakened since the first advent. So again, the idea isn't that everything is honky dory and there's no problems in the world. There's no sin. There's no demonic activity. No, that is very much real. Um, but it is something that has been lessened so that the gospel can go out. And again, how optimistic you are is going to depend on how post or ah mill you are. Whereas, you know, an, an ah mill would say that it's more uh, the gospel's being preached. And the post millennial would say, well, it's more the gospel's or the gospel message is succeeding in saving. Uh, again, just they're, they're more optimistic. Um, Again, we should have put that in earlier, but, uh, <laughs> but that got skipped. <laughs> All good. But yeah, so we got uh, Dr. Kim Riddlebarger coming on in two weeks, so that's going to be awesome, and uh, we're going to keep on keep on going from there. So I hope this has been informative for you guys. Again, our heart behind this um, is uh, just really to uh, to build unity, to give you guys something to study. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's good stuff, man. So we will uh, we'll be back in two weeks. Sounds good. Yeah. I'm excited for Riddle Barger. I've been going through his book and it's he he's very good. Yeah. Uh no, I picked, I couldn't find an audiobook. I have the hardest I guess eschatology is too narrow of a thing for there to be audiobooks on like a, like there's tons of lectures and stuff, but like actually what did we forget about the holiness of God or something? Did we forget that God owes us the rod or something? See the snake proves for Christ came to save dudes who hate truth the gospel. Oh, that's an audiobook. Okay. Well, it's not. It's it's basically just him talking. It's like a lecture series, essentially, but it's like 30 hours. Okay. And